All right, everybody, if I could encourage you to go ahead and return to your seat. Today's a marathon service, many awesome things to celebrate. Okay, so as Pastor Dan had already made mention that uh, today is a bridge celebration. For those of you who don't know, we have a year-long residential recovery ministry called The Bridge, and it's a faith-based discipleship program. And so we, we take uh, men who are struggling with any kind of life-dominating sin or substance abuse or anything like that and bring them in and give them a safe um, place to live for a year, and we just disciple them intensely. And we do CrossFit in the morning, and then they work throughout the day, and we have all kinds of Bible study and mentorship and church and service and everything that's just built into that. And really, uh, hope is in a new heart. Amen? Amen? Hope is in a new heart. And so that's, we believe God draws these brothers here, you know, changes their lives, saves them, and then we get to see the fruit of a changed life. And it's exciting for us, for the body of Christ, to be able to see this kind of thing happening regularly as it ought to. And so uh, today is a day of great celebration, and I won't say any more. I'm going to let uh, Pastor Aaron and his wife Jackie come up, and they're going to share a little bit. And then obviously Spencer will come up, and uh, the Lord is good. Amen? All right, come on up. All right, good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right, glad you guys are here with us this morning. Well, Pastor Rob uh, kind of just gave the rundown, which saved me a few minutes, which is good. Um, this is a great thing we get to do in front of the church uh, because this is a, a ministry that is supported by the church. And, you know, I was thinking of uh, Third John uh, 1, I think it's 4, yep, came to mind this morning where he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Not only do we hear it, but we get to see it firsthand about you know, what's happening and the work that God is doing uh, in regenerating these men and, and uh, helping them to come to a saving knowledge of Christ and learn how to walk in that truth. And so, and it's all you know, because of you guys and the support and the prayer and donations, whatever it is, um, we're just grateful. So we thank you guys uh, for everything that you guys do to, to support and come alongside because it's, this is a, a family event, and so that's why we're doing this here. So, anyways, we'll go ahead and bring up Spencer real quick. <laughs> so this is Spencer H. We had two Spencers. We got a house of six, and somehow we ended up with two Spencers and two Coles. How, I don't know, but anyways, so Spencer H. Um, obviously, you guys know Spencer. He's been with us for about 14 months now. And, you know, this has been a real privilege to watch him uh, grow over the last 14 months. And when he first got here, I remember I picked him up at the bus stop here in Napa. And I was sitting there waiting. He shows up. I see him get off the bus. I already knew Spencer because he was in leadership in Monterey down there. I didn't like him when he was down there. He came up here. <laughs> so he didn't know that. I just told him that right now. Yeah. He, anyways... So he comes down here, he shows up, he gets off the bus, he makes, you know, makes a run to the garbage can real quick for some reason, and then comes back to where he thinks his bag is, and the next thing you know, he's sprinting down the street after the bus, and I was just like, this is great. <laughs> this is so awesome. I just had a blast watching him chase the bus down the street that didn't see him and did not stop, and then he came walking back over. Turns out he thought he left his bag on the bus, but he didn't, so he was running down the street for no reason, but that was... You know, sinfully, probably that brought me great joy to watch that, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, he came in and, uh, you know, took me a little while to warm up, as it does with most of the guys. But I'll tell you what, over the last 14 months, this guy's just really become very near and dear to my heart and to just like all the guys. We love all the guys, you know, but um, it's just been a blessing to watch him grow and watch him um, just really, really seek after the Lord. I mean, he's really prioritized that and purposed it in his heart to be a man of God and to live a holy life set apart um, and has a desire to be in ministry as the Lord leads and whenever that time comes. So um, it's been really awesome to see him. We just want to pray over him and send him out with a blessing in a few minutes here. Um, but I'm going to let my wife say a few words and then we'll go from there. 
Good morning. Well, uh, as Aaron said, it's, sometimes it takes us a <clears throat> little bit to warm up to these guys. And um, Austin and Spencer were friends, and I remember Austin kind of talking to me about when he came in. And I was like, oh, I don't like this guy, Austin. He's like, well, just give it some time. And sure enough, this guy just really gets a hold of me. And I tell Austin, like, all right, I've really warmed up to this guy, but don't tell him. I don't want him to know yet. <laughs> and so, uh, but... Yeah. He didn't, yeah. <laughs> but we uh, have had the great privilege to uh, spend the last uh, year with Spencer, and um, he's really bonded with our kids and with us, and we uh, love him immensely, and we have the privilege to live with him, and uh, he lives in our house, and has a little, his room has a, a lock, and I call it the magic portal, because when that door gets unlocked, there is a swarm of dog and people and kids all making their way into his room to see him and Spencer and everybody gets so excited and he's just become such a uh, love and a blessing to our family and we are just have been so grateful for uh, you being a part of our lives and it's been a real privilege and a real honor so thank you now Spencer is going to say a few words Good morning, everyone. Hope you guys all had a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year to all of you. Um, as Jackie and Aaron made very clear, I was not the most likable person when I showed up here. And uh, I felt the same way about myself. Um, I knew in my heart that I wasn't where I needed to be. Uh, I got saved radically in 2018, February 24th, when I was in the bridge in Monterey. The Lord revealed himself to me and I was changed in that moment. But I wasn't fully sanctified yet, nor am I now fully sanctified. But I will say that I've, I've, I've gone through a lot to get to this point. And all I can really say is that I have nothing to offer in this life. Uh, my flesh, the person that I am apart from Christ, I, got, I have nothing to offer. And God has made me in a way that I am so pathetically weak that I can't operate or function in the world apart from him. I just can't. Um, some people can, to an extent. I'm not one of them. I will relapse. I will use drugs, alcohol, whatever I can get my hands on. I will steal. I will lie. And that doesn't change. That part of me does not change. My flesh does not change. But the Christ in me will enable me and help me to persevere, to be a new creation, like the Bible says that we are. For those who are in Christ, we are new people, new creations. I might as well be an entirely different person. So it's all him. It's all Christ. He gets all the glory because he changed me. But it's been a process to actually see that physically from another person's point of view, obviously, because you know I was a Christian for three years when I met these guys, and it wasn't very clear to them. You know, so it's a process. This whole thing is a process, and I'm just grateful that they have opened up their doors to me. When I first called Aaron and asked him if there was availability in the bridge in Napa, um, it wasn't the most pleasant conversation. It wasn't like he said, no, you, who are you? It was just like, he was very firm with me. Like, why, why are you even wanting to do this? You know, he was asking me difficult questions, and I had to step back and think about it. Like, do I really, do I just need a place to go, or do I really want to change? And so um, I just, I can't tell you guys enough, or I just can't tell you guys like how much love and respect I have for these two people right here and their family. I love you kids so much. And I love you guys so much. I'm so grateful for what you guys have done for me. I mean, the, the, I've been through programs before like this, but this is so different because it's so intimate. It's like a, it's a family setting. It's a family setting. They embrace you and they take you in like you're part of the family. There's programs that, I'm sure there's plenty of programs in this country, in this world that offer something similar to that, but I've never experienced it. But I've experienced it here. There's real love here. They're laying down their life to offer up a place for people to stay, to live, to grow. And they disciple and they, they invest into your life and they ask you difficult questions. They want to know more and they want to know why and they ask you things that other people don't ask. And it's an opportunity for a person to change here in this place. And that's, that's not to discredit what happens in Monterey. That's a wonderful place, too, the Bridge of Monterey. It's incredible. Any program that promotes Christ, there's an opportunity for a person to change. 
And I, and I also, I can't thank the brothers enough. The guys that I went through the program with, it's so special because you're, I mean, we are all grown men. And so we struggle. We are, we're all very different. So it's hard to get a flow in the house when you're living with people you've never lived with before that you don't really know very well personally. But once you get to that point where you kind of know how to move and groove in the house, it's amazing. It doesn't get any better than that. That situation with Mike and Spencer and Cole, Jacoby popping in whenever he needs to, Scott Conley, you know, we got, we got Darren now, we got, we got Sean, we got Nick, you know, and, and this is a new house that's kind of coming up now. And they're going to, they're going to, the next guys that come in, they're going to love on them too. And it just keeps going and going. Underwood, you know, Cole Underwood, love that guy. You know, when I first showed up, he was leading us. He was our leader at work every day. And, and he was a good example of what Christ has done in, in, in his life. And he was very clear in that it was all Christ and not him. And so I'm sorry to ramble a little bit, but I, this is just an incredible place. And I'm so grateful for it. I'm so grateful for what Christ has done and that he, would, he was so pleased to reveal his son to me. It's just amazing to me because I don't deserve it. Patty, I love you so much. I love you. Tim, Diane. James, Pastor Dan, Pastor Rob, you know, I, and I'm going to forget people. Keith, of course, very faithful to show up. Regent, you know, like Penelope, Mia, McKenna, Isaiah, I love you guys. I want that to be very clear that I love you guys and I'm grateful for you guys. And you guys keep me in check because I don't want to screw up. I don't want to have to explain myself to Penelope. Where, why is Spencer not showing up anymore? Where'd he go? I can't do that. So praise the Lord. Thank you guys so much for your time. And I'm just, I'm very grateful for this ministry and for what Christ has done. So thank you guys. Amen. <clears throat> and just, uh, you know, really reiterate, it's all, it's all Christ. It's all him. You know, we just, the bridge is just kind of like a, you know, it's a jar of clay, if you will. It's just a place where God does work on these men and we all get to support and, and watch firsthand what's happening and the radical life tra transformation. So we're pretty, we're privileged. We're very privileged in that, in that way. So anyways, we love you too. And uh, we're blessed that you were here with us. Um, the last thing I just want to say is I just want to say thank you to our kids. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to pull this off. They, they endure a lot and uh, they're very supportive and they make a difference in the lives of these guys. And they add value and strength to this ministry that uh, we can't really describe. And we have people that will, you know, kind of stand against that a little bit and make comments about it and things. But we trust Christ in this. And I know it's uh, unique. And I know that some of the guys take more than to them than others. But um, there's a lot of value there. So I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, that's it. We love you guys. So anyways, I'm a little emotional today. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to pray for Spencer, and then we're going we're gonna to go ahead and do a, another send-off here in just a minute. So Rob, you want to come up? And Dan, we'll pray with this guy, since you're already going to be up here anyways. Take your time, Dan. No hurry. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> come on over. <laughs> All right. Father, you're good. You deserve all the credit, all the glory, all the adoration, Lord, for uh, what you've done in Spencer's life, not only Spencer's, but each one of these men here that have come to know you and have been saved. Thank you for plucking him out of the fire, for pulling him from the pit, for putting a new heart in him, for transforming this man's life. Uh, his desire is no longer to be conformed, but to be transformed, and that is evident. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for the great joy and privilege it is to walk to walk with him and to watch what you're doing in his life firsthand. Um, let us not miss those things because it's, it's, so, it's so powerful that we're exposed to it so much that we can actually miss uh, some of what's, what's happening. <coughs> Excuse me. But we're grateful for his life. We pray a blessing over it, Lord. We pray that you would raise him up and strengthen him, continue to sanctify him, Father, that your call on his life would only increase. Uh, that his life would, that he would be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ, that he would say to live as Christ, to die as gain. And so continue, Lord, to work and move in him mightily and powerfully. 
uh, that he might influence others, that he might uh, multiply, that you might multiply through him. So we thank you, Lord. Bless him and keep him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So one more thing, but before we do uh, get to that, thanks, brother. Just to be clear, they don't lock Spencer in his room. That's not what that is. It's uh, like an apartment attached to the house with an outdoor entrance and a door that leads into the, the rest of the house. And so there's like hours where the door is locked and not locked and there's family time and all of that. So I was, I was like, I better explain that just a little bit. But anyways... All right, so uh, this, as I said, this is a marathon service today, but it's all good. I do have a short message, so uh, don't sweat that. And what a great way to start the new year out. God's doing a lot of wonderful things, amen. There's a lot to rejoice in. So we have uh, some missionaries with us today, Gary and Carrie Gu, and they serve down in Cabo St. Lucas, and they're doing an awesome work, and they're building a Calvary Chapel down there, and uh, they serve under the pastor there, the lead pastor. His name is Gary Price, and they uh, do a lot with the children's ministry, a lot of outreach. There's some of the hardest working, faithful laborers in God's uh, harvest field, whatever you want to call it, that I have known personally. And uh, we're so grateful to be able to support them. And so when you give to the church, obviously that goes towards supporting these uh, faithful workers. And we just want to bring them up while they're here with us. They've been in. Come on up. Don't be shy. Um, They're in town for a few weeks, and uh, I think they'll be going back home soon. But just didn't want to let them go without bringing them up and just praying God's blessing over them for the work that they have done and will do for God's endurance and perseverance and all that good stuff. Amen? All right. So we love you very much, and we, uh, we're grateful to you and the example that you set and the work that you do where God has placed you, and we're excited for the years to come to continue to uh, partner with you and invest in y'all's ministry. Amen? Okay. Father, we love you. We thank you that you're a God who is mighty to save, that you are in the business of saving lives, changing lives all over the world. You're doing things right here in our backyard, and you're doing things all around the world, and that's all part of your design, the Great Commission, you know, to go into all the world and to make disciples. And so thank you for Gary and Carrie and how you're using them, how you have been using them, and Lord, we know that being a missionary can be so incredibly difficult. Most of us, if not all of us, really don't know uh, just how taxing, how relentlessly difficult it can be in the spiritual warfare that goes on. And so, Lord, we just lift them up to your grace and bring them before your, your throne. And we just ask that you would lavish blessing upon them, that you would pour your spirit out upon them freshly that they would go back to Mexico with a renewed vision and fire and excitement and joy in what they're doing for you, and that, God, you would do brand new things, things that they've never even seen up to this point, God, that you would take them deeper into a place of deeper love and devotion to you and greater service and greater holiness and greater effectiveness for your kingdom and for your church that you are building here on this earth. And so we praise you, Father. And we, we uh, ask your blessing that your work would be furthered and that you would continue to multiply disciples and churches and use us for your glory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We love you guys. <laughs> yeah. Amen. All right, here we go. I almost feel like we should do another meet and greet before we get going because uh, y'all have already been sitting again for quite a length of time, but we will not do that. All right, so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, amen. We've been out of John for a little while as I was in Israel for a few weeks and uh, all that good stuff, but we are back and ready to get after it. 
And what a great place to start. John chapter 14. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one near you. I uh, just want to kind of set the context for us again before we dive back in. And as I said, we've been out for a little bit. But before we even do that, would you please join me as we seek the Lord's blessing upon the message? Father, we come before you now and we continue to worship you as we open your word. As we look into the Holy Scriptures, this inspired truth that you have delivered to us and preserved down through the ages, and now we have a copy of our very own, and we have your Holy Spirit to guide us. And so please, Lord, open our eyes and our hearts, and may we receive much comfort and encouragement. May we be shepherded today by your Word, your living, holy Word. May you be glorified here today. May you be exalted. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would speak to us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, today we begin our journey through John chapter 14 as we are working our way through the gospel of John chapter by chapter. And chapter 14 is a part of a larger unit called the Upper Room Discourse. And so it's five chapters, 13 through 17. Now, chapters 1 through 12 took place in a period of three years, from the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, teaching, preaching, healing, so on and so forth. Now, Jesus has entered into what we call His private ministry, and chapters 13 through 17 take place in the course of just a few hours. And Jesus has now set His attention on His disciples, and He is having this very intimate moment with them as He teaches them before he goes to the cross. This very night, he's going to be betrayed, and he's going to be arrested, and the following day, he'll be crucified. And so these are very important words, if you will. And Jesus is preparing them for what is to come, for what is to come in the following hours, and how they are to carry on in his absence. And today, what we are going to see is that Jesus is going to stop, and He is going to give them hope. He's going to give hope to His disciples in the midst of severe distress, because up to this point in this setting where we are at the Last Supper, Jesus has said some very difficult things to them, and they are in turmoil. They are distressed. They are deeply vexed and troubled. And Jesus kind of pauses for a moment, and He encourages their hearts. He encourages their hearts. He gives them hope. And hope, my brothers and sisters, is a major topic throughout the Bible. Major. The Bible has so much to say about hope because hope is so incredibly important. Everybody needs hope. Everybody needs hope in this life and hope for the life to come. When people lose hope, bad things happen. Bad things happen. Marriages fail on and on, and and people even end their own lives sometimes when all hope is lost. It's devastating to be without hope. And I think everybody has had the feeling that all hope was lost. Proverbs 13 says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. You ever had a sick heart because of hopelessness? It says that when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hopelessness is like having a sick heart, but when we have hope, it is like a tree of life. It's good. It's good. Now, I would say that many of us and many people in the world have hope. There's no doubt about that, but I would say it's a a misplaced hope. It's a misplaced hope, hoping in all the wrong things, hoping for things that will surely eventually fail us. Some people, many people, hope in themselves, especially when it comes to matters of eternal life. If you ask somebody whether they, if they died today, if they would go to heaven, they would typically say yes because, by and large, they're a good person, or that they've done more good things than bad things, and that is hoping in themselves for salvation. And that will fail them severely on that great day when they stand before God. There is no hope in ourselves to attain to salvation. Our only hope can be in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. People put all kinds of hope in humanity, thinking that somehow there's something in us individually and we come together corporately and we can, we can solve all the world's problems. I mean, how has that been working out? You've been watching the news lately? 
You know, I mean, you just get up and look at the news any given morning, and you think, gosh, there's no hope. There's no hope in this world. There's no hope in humanity. People put hope in a person. Sometimes they think a relationship will satisfy, and then they'll be fulfilled and content. And if only they had this one person, then they would realize, they would, you know, everything would be good. But then how quickly do we realize that it doesn't work that way? People, we can't put our hope in people. People let us down. We let people down, right? People put their hope in a bigger house, a better career, more money. People put their hope in movements, political parties. Man, have we seen that in the last few years or not? And people hope in hope. People say, you know, faith in faith, hope in hope. But on what basis does their hope rest? You know, what is the object of their hope or their faith? Oftentimes they can't answer that. And so we have to hope in something that is greater than ourselves, greater than anything that this world has to offer. Our hope has to be in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, I think oftentimes people misunderstand what hope even is. Hope tends to be wishful thinking. I hope I get that promotion. I hope I don't get sick, right? We use hope in that way. But biblically, hope is a confidence. It's a, it's a trust. It's a certainty. It's an eager expectation. When I say I hope in Jesus Christ, that is not wishful thinking. I know that my Savior lives, and I know that He will see me to the very end, and I know that I will stand in glory forgiven on that great day because of His finished work on my behalf at the cross. Amen? Amen. Absolute certainty and full assurance In Christ, we have hope for eternity. We know that we know that we have eternal life. In Christ, we have hope in this life, a hope for peace, for provision, for protection, for preservation. We have hope. We have hope for the salvation of our loved ones. We have a hope that causes us to live pure lives in expectation for our Savior. 1 John 3 says, Beloved, We are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And listen to this, and everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself, even as He is pure. If you have that hope, the hope of eternal life, the hope that Jesus is coming back and that you're going to be with Him, that kind of hope It causes you to purify your own life by God's grace and God's Spirit, to live in eager expectation because we want to be pleasing to our King. Amen? We want to be found pleasing in His sight when He returns, when He comes back for us. Hope in Christ is something that helps us to persevere through suffering and hardship in this life. Hope is what gives us the ability to endure, to just take one more step, to keep putting one foot in front of the other, one day at a time. And hope is what motivates us to labor for the unseen things, for that which is eternal. If we don't have hope in Christ, then why do we do what we do in our service to Him? If we don't believe in heaven, if we don't believe in heavenly reward, then why do we do what we do? But if you are gripped by the conviction that Christ is risen, He's alive, He is your Savior, and that one day you'll stand before Him, that motivates, that compels us to live for Him to serve Him, even in discouragement, even if it seems like there is no fruit, even in the midst of our own weakness and our own insufficiency, we have hope. And so we endure, we persevere, and we serve for eternal unseen things. Amen? Amen. Can I get an amen? Amen. Is that too much to ask for an amen? I know I've already asked for about 15 of them. I'm sorry. I'm an amener. All right, let's go. So hope. Praise God that we have hope. We need hope. And Jesus is going to offer hope for troubled hearts. That's the the title of my message, Hope for Troubled Hearts. So two points, very simple. We're only looking at three verses today, three verses. And so the first point, Jesus comforts His disciples by encouraging their faith in God. Jesus comforts His disciples by encouraging their faith in God. Verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
Now, suffice it to say, it has been a very troubling evening for the disciples. You know, these men, they left everything behind to follow Jesus. For these three years, they've been with Him, living with Him, following Him, having a certain expectation for how all the things are going to go. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is telling them He's going to die. He says that, uh, you know, they're gonna, He's going to be betrayed. That someone at the table is going to betray Him. That Peter is going to deny even knowing Him three times before the morning even comes that all the disciples are going to be scattered, that they're going to abandon Him. And He tells them that He's leaving and where He's going, they cannot follow. I mean, so we can just, I mean, you can, you can sense what it must have been like at the table there when Jesus says this kind of stuff to them. The ominous feeling that must have filled the room, the, the intensity of it all, the confusion, the, the anxiety, the distress, the trouble. No wonder Jesus says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. I mean, no wonder. But what does Jesus do? Jesus redirects their troubled hearts. He doesn't just say, hey, stop being worried. It's going to be okay. You know, He redirects their hearts to something greater, something higher. It's to faith. Have faith in God. Trust God. And that's ultimately what hope is. Hope is faith, believing in the unseen, believing in God, believing that He exists, believing that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hope is faith. Faith is hope. And I love how Jesus juxtaposes troubled hearts and belief in God. He says, stop doing this and start doing this. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. There's the solution to a troubled heart. Believe God. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe God. He puts it one right beside the other. That is the the principle of the Scriptures to put off and put on. Put off the old man and his corrupt ways. Put on the new man who's created in Christ Jesus. Put off a troubled heart. Put on faith. Trust, believe, hope in God. You know what? Trusting, believing, and hoping in God has always been a source of strength. That's why in Isaiah, it could say, 26 verse 3, you keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because He trusts in you. He trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. When everything seems like it is falling down, when the world around us is quaking and shaking, our God is an everlasting rock. He does not crumble. He does not fail. He does not falter. He is solid. He is stable. He is sure. He is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our belief. He is worthy of our praise, and we can rest in Him. Amen? God has demonstrated time and time again that He is faithful to us. Even when we are faithless, He is God and He can do no other. God is love. God is good. God is light. God is… He is enduring. God is patient. Amen? Amen. God is for us. Who can be against us? God is with us and He will never forsake us. See, that's the, that's the basis of our trust and our faith. There is hope in God. And so no matter what is going on in your life right now, you can transcend that. You can set your hope and you can fix your gaze upon a faithful God. Now, if I'm honest, this can be very difficult to do. At times, it seems nearly impossible Because human emotions and spiritual attack can be a fierce foe, a ferocious enemy. I mean, we all know this. Head tripping, just emotional ups and downs, discouragement, depression, despair, anxiety, compounded by the lies and the trickery of the enemy. 
It's intense, and the battle is real, and it's hard sometimes to do these things. It's hard to redirect our focus and our attention on eternal matters. But there's no other way. That is the answer. That is the solution. That is the hope for a troubled heart, and that is what Jesus offers to the disciples. And by God's grace and by God's Spirit, as we grow and our knowledge of Him and, and our own sanctification and discipline is something that we have to learn to do. David could say in Psalm 43, 5 to himself, Why are you so downcast, O my soul? Has your soul ever felt downcast? He could say to himself, Why are you down? And why are you in turmoil within? Hope in God, is what David says. Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. That was how David preached to himself when he was in the lowest pit. Why am I in such distress? Why is my soul so low? Hope in God, I will again praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him. Amen? Praise Him. And here's the thing. Hoping in God is a lifelong, reoccurring choice. If you feel like you have blown it up to this point, that you haven't done a good job in this, don't worry, you're going to have another chance. And it's going to happen over and over and over. You're going to always find yourself in a situation where you have a choice to make. Am I going to believe what the Word of God says? Am I going to trust God, trust His character, trust Him, or am I going to let this issue that's in front of me be a mountain that blocks my view of God. You know, we have, to, we have to make that decision. And sometimes, look, we just have to cry out. And sometimes maybe all that you can even muster is help. Maybe that's all that you can even say. You know, there's a, a, we have an online prayer chain. Uh, you can email prayer requests, write prayer requests, put them in the box back there and It's been going for years, and I I know a brother here who said that for years he was suffering with great sickness, and sometimes he would just be in such a a bad, low, horrible spot in his health, all he could do was muster up help on the prayer chain, help. And I just thought, that is amazing to me, you know. uh, Sometimes that's all we got, but you know what? That's enough. If you have the faith of a mustard seed, what does Jesus say? It can move mountains. Help, God, help. Help me. You don't have to wax eloquently. O thou God of from everlasting to everlasting. Like sometimes help. Help me. God is faithful, amen. We can come to him. We can come to him with for hope. And Jesus not only encourages them to believe God, he also says, Believe in me. Believe in God. Believe in me. Now, think about this. If Jesus were not equal with God, this would be nothing short of blasphemy. It would be like me saying, hey, guys, believe in Jesus and believe in me. I mean, that that would be bad, right? And and so, for Jesus to say, believe God and believe me, He's claiming equality with the Father. He and the Father are one. And that is key to the section that we are in Um, And we'll be talking about that more in the coming weeks, but I just couldn't pass up pointing that out. Make no mistake what Jesus says about Himself in the Scriptures. Believe God, believe me. And, And what He's essentially saying is, as surely as you believe and hope in the Father, you can do the same with me. As surely as you believe and trust the Father, believe and trust the Son. J.C. Ryle, uh, um, pastor, commentator, he says this, faith in the Lord Jesus is the only sure medicine for troubled hearts. To believe more thoroughly, trust more entirely, rest more unreservedly, lay hold more firmly, lean back more completely. This is the prescription which our master urges on the attention of all of his disciples. And Jesus encourages the disciples that they're going to be with Him again. Jesus says, believe in God, believe in Me also. And that's what we're going to see next. Now, I just want to say this. I love this about Jesus. 
All the disciples are about to fail miserably. They are all about to fail tonight. And Jesus looks past all of that. Jesus sees past all of that. He sees the greater good, the bigger picture. He knows the beginning. He knows the end from the beginning. He's not surprised. He's telling them before it even happens. But then He's looking beyond that. And sometimes we can't do that. In fact, we can't. We don't know the future, and sometimes when we are in the deep and deepest, lowest, darkest pit, when we are in just utter failure, we're, we're just lost, we're stuck, we're hopeless, we're helpless, but God sees beyond that. God knows what He's doing in that situation in and through you and to you, and God knows what He's going to do with you on the other side of that situation. Amen? And so, having the ability to see beyond the immediate. I mean, that was what compelled Jesus to endure the cross, the joy that was set before Him. He looked beyond the cross. He despised the shame. He endured the cross because He knew that there was something greater that would lie ahead. The salvation for an untold multitude that would give Him glory and honor that He is so worthy of. He was willing to suffer. And so, in the same way, Jesus sees something greater. He sees beyond the failure of the disciples, and I love that. Jesus sees beyond your failures. He sees beyond my failures. He sees beyond our weaknesses. He knows what He intends to do with us and how we will give God glory. Amen. Let's rest in that. This brings me to point number two. Jesus comforts His disciples by assuring them that they will be with Him. I love that. Jesus comforts His disciples by assuring them that they will be with Him again. Verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to Myself, that where I am you may be also. Now, Jesus moved beyond the immediate and comforts them with His return. Now, it's significant. He could just say, hey, guys, look, I know it seems real bad tonight and then for the next couple of days, but just here in just a few days, it's going to be all good. And then, you know, 50 days after that, the Holy Spirit is going to fall and you guys are going to be radically transformed and you're going to take the world by storm and you're going to be raising people from the dead and casting out demons and preaching to thousands. It's going to be amazing. Jesus didn't go into any of that. He just said, I'm going to make a place for you, and where I am, you're going to be with me. That was how Jesus comforted them. And this is very beautiful language, and you're going to, you would miss it at first glance, but there's something very significant going on here. This is absolutely borrowing the language from a Jewish wedding uh, custom, Jewish wedding customs and tradition. Let me explain that to us a little bit. In a Jewish wedding, uh, in the proposal, there's a, there's a year-long betrothal period, and it's contractual. So, uh, you have a, a husband and wife-to-be, there's the betrothal, uh, it's a year, and during that time, it's legally binding. And so, if you break that contract, that's basically like divorcing. Uh, if there was infidelity during that time, it's, it's like, you know, totally cheating on a, on a spouse. And so, it was very serious, but they didn't live together during this time. For a, about a year, the husband-to-be would go, and he would prepare a home for his future bride and him to live in, but typically, it wouldn't be a separate home. They would add on to the father's house. Uh, they would just continue to expand uh, the, the, the groom, his, his home, make it bigger, and he and his wife would live there at the Father's house. They would just add rooms onto it. You get what I'm saying? And even the son or the, the, the groom doesn't know the exact day or time that he's to go and get his bride. She doesn't know. He doesn't know. It's in the Father's hand. Now, we know it's approximately a year, but the exact day and time, no one knows. The bride-to-be is to go home and to prepare herself and to anticipate with eagerness that day that is to come, and to be ready at any moment, the son is to go and to prepare a place, and when the father feels that all the necessary arrangements have been made, he'll go to his son and send him to go and get his bride. 
And when the son comes, uh, the, the groom, he takes his bride, and there's a, a procession back to the place where they're going to have the wedding. And it's celebrating in the streets. It's a huge deal. And then the festivities to follow could last for weeks. It's, it's you know, a very big deal. And so you can just hear that in the language that Jesus uses. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I do, I will return again for you so that where I am, you can be also. It's glorious. It's beautiful. It's, it's amazing. And some people see this as one of the key passages for the rapture of the church. It is to be a true encouragement for the believer. Our Lord has gone to the Father's house. We're waiting for Him to return at a time that we do not know, but He's going to come when we least expect it. And so we, in the meantime, are to ready ourselves. We are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ, the church. And He's going to come for His bride. And He's going to present her to the Father in radiant splendor with no spot, no blemish, but simply glorious because we're going to be washed clean, pure, white, because of what Jesus has done for His church. Amen? And that is to be an encouragement for the believer. To be with Jesus in this life and in the next come is the greatest longing of the heart. That actually is kind of the point of Christianity. It's Jesus. It's to be with Jesus. It's to have fellowship with this, in this life with Jesus and to be like Jesus and then to be with Him when it's all said and done. That is the overarching goal of Christianity. Sure, there's more to it than that. That, that might be an oversimplification, so to speak. But Jesus is the goal, to be with Jesus, you know. There's a lot of people that want heaven, but they just don't want God to be there when they get there. You know, they, uh, you know sure, eternal life and, and not being in torment, that's appealing but Christianity is so much more than that. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. Amen? And we get to be with Him, and we get to worship Him. You know, right now it's hard because we have so many competing things, our, our loyalty, our affection, our devotion. We spend it on so many other lesser things, worthless things. Our minds are so distracted and our hearts are so tugged on, it's hard even to come into a place like this and worship the Lord uh, intently, intensely, with, with focus and the kind that He deserves. But on that great day, there will be none of that. There will be no pain, no suffering, no sin, no sorrow, no distraction, just pure joy in the presence of our Savior with magnificent, marvelous worship of which He is worthy. Amen? So to be with Jesus, to be in fellowship with Him now in His Word and prayer, in fellowship one with another, obeying His commands. He said, if you love me, what? You'll keep my commands. Doing what He says to do because we love Him, because we believe that He has what's best for us in mind. His commands are not burdensome, they're for our good, and they please Him. And so we want to be in good fellowship with Him, and so we keep His commands. Amen? We live lives that please Him. We make that our aim. And we want to be with His people. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ dwells in me, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. And when we dwell together in unity and fellowship, we are experiencing the love of Christ. We are experiencing the warmth and the embrace and the care and the encouragement of Christ when we come together as the body of Christ in this fellowship. That's what it means to be with Jesus. That's a very real part of it. And if you are severed from fellowship, you're missing out. You're missing out on a very real component of being a Christian, of being with Christ by being with His people. So the hope of heaven is to be with Jesus and where He is. He says that where I am, you will be also. And so we have hope, brothers and sisters. We have something to hope in. Not the kind of hope that the world offers, a hope that is sure to fail, a hope that is empty and shallow, a hope that is futile. We have true and abiding hope. Amen? We have hope in Jesus Christ our Savior. You know what? There was a time when we didn't have hope. We had no hope. Now, we might have deceived ourselves into thinking that we had some kind, of a, some kind of hope, but the Bible says that we were utterly without hope. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, 
who are called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hands. I'll explain that in a minute. I know that's confusing. That at that time you were without Christ. Listen to this. You were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants and the promises of God, having no hope and without God in this world. There was a time when God was working solely in Israel. Israel was God's chosen people, and either you were a Jew or you were a Gentile, and Gentiles, that's all that simply means is non-Jew. And you were outside of God's promise, God's, God's uh, blessings. That, that was strictly for the people of Israel. To them, God revealed Himself as Father, as Creator, and was in covenant relationship with And so, God gave hope to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Jesus broke down that middle wall of separation and brought salvation not just for God's chosen people Israel, but for the whole world. And there was a time when those who were outside of Israel were without hope, outside of God's blessing, aliens from God, without God in this world. And that is us too. There was a time when we were aliens. We were estranged from God. We did not have hope. We didn't have His blessing. We were separated from Him. But you know what? In Christ, we have true hope. 1 Peter 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. Amen? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We were hopeless. We were without hope in this world, but because of what Christ has done for us, He died for our sin and rose again, and He's a living Savior. We have a living hope. Now we are a people of hope, amen? And our hope is solely in Christ. J.C. Ryle says, how much they possess who live the life of faith in the Son of God and believe in Jesus. With all their weaknesses and crosses, They have that which the world can neither give nor take away. They have a true friend while they live and a true home when they die. The world cannot give us hope, and it really can't take it away. We have something that Jesus alone can offer, a true friend in this life and a true home when we pass from this to the next. Amen? We have hope. I pray that today you have hope. If you have a troubled heart, I hope that Jesus is ministering to you right now by His Word and His Holy Spirit and showing you that you really have hope. If you came in here today and you don't know Jesus Christ and you feel like you are separated from God without hope in this world, there is hope. Amen? There is a living hope. Giving your life to Jesus. You may not understand all of this right now, but simply knowing that God is real and that Jesus is His Son and that there is life in His name and that there is forgiveness in Him and that you need forgiveness, and that you want forgiveness, and then to simply confess, I'm a sinner, Jesus. Forgive me. I need you. I want you. I want to be with you, with you in this life and the next. I need healing. I need comfort. I need hope. I need strength. I need peace. I need joy. I need assurance of everlasting life. All of that is available to you in Jesus Christ. All you have to do is trust Him, call upon His name, believe Him, Forsake trusting in yourself, forsake trusting in this world, and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He's good. He's worthy. May we find our hope and our comfort in Him. Pastor Dan's going to come up at this point. He's going to close with the song. I'm going to pray for us. After the song is over, I'll come up and close with a closing blessing. But would you join me in prayer? We love you, Jesus, and we do hope in you. We do place our trust in you. We do desire to enjoy you in this life, to experience the deepest fellowship that we can, and we do desire to be with you where you are. And thank you that that is our ultimate hope, that where you are, we will be with you also one day. One day. We don't know when that is. You know but we look forward to it in faith with anticipation. And in the meantime, we are eager to live for your glory, to serve you, to bless you, to reflect your glory in this dark world, and to extend hope, to extend your hope into this world that is desperately broken and hurting and needing 
answers. You are the answer. You're the way, the truth, the life, and we have you. We have all. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Shot. Your righteousness has made me whole. like you Lord There is none like you No one else compares To all your majesty The world will know your name As you are lifted high and all will bow down Who is like you No one else compares To everything you are To all the things you do Who is like you I live because you are My everlasting arms You are so beautiful Who is like you no one else compares to everything you are, to all the things you do. Who is like you? I live because you are my everlasting arms. You are so beautiful. Righteousness has made me whole. Who is like you, Lord? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up your countenance and give you peace. Go with God's blessing this week. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next Sunday.